Okay, this is the lecture for my fifth hour class on April the 11th. Monday, April the 11th. Okay, well, uh, we talked about the fact that um, the uh, last czar of Russia was a man named Nicholas II. He became the czar of Russia. All my gadgets turned on here. He became the czar of Russia in 1894. His father died unexpectedly, and he really, he really didn't, he really didn't want the job, but he took it. And he was married to a woman from Austria named Alexandra. And you know, one of the things that royals are required to do is to produce an heir. And what the Russian people wanted was a son. They just thought that uh, if a woman could not handle it. Uh, of course, we talked about Catherine the Great, probably the strongest ruler. Russia ever had, Catherine the Great, but uh, they just sort of ignored that fact of history, and they thought, uh, we must have a boy, and the, the czar and his wife began to have children, they had four girls in a row, uh, and he, they had just about given up um, ever of ever having a son, the Russian people thought, well, we'll be ruled by a czarina when the czar dies, and then in 1907, to the wonderment of all, the... Uh, Queen of Russia, the Tsar, Rina, gave birth to a little boy. And there was initial rejoicing. Their prayers had been answered. But then in the midst of all this re rejoicing, they discovered that the little boy was a hemophiliac. And again, I emphasize today, if you are a hemophiliac, you can live a normal life. Medical science has advanced a lot in the last 100 years. But that was still all in the future. So the little boy had to be very careful with this little boy. And the best kept secret in Russia was, I mean, they didn't let that out the palace. The best kept secret was the little boy was a hemophiliac. Uh, and of course, in 1912, while the family was on a vacation, the little boy suffered a fall. Uh, they thought he was dying. He almost did die. In the last minute, the Tsarina was informed about a man who would have, her sister had called a holy man. And they call and Rasputin, right? We've done this. Yes. Rasputin, they got him on the phone and he said, get the doctors out of the room. Don't let them bother the little boy very much. And they did what he said and the little boy lived. And from that moment on, the Tsarina became convinced that the life of her little boy, indeed the life of all of Russia, the future of Russia, <coughs> was in the hands of Grigory Rasputin, uh, who's in history, he's called the mad monk. He wasn't really a priest. He was an absolute moral abscess. He was filthy in his habits. Uh, he was uh, any, He was the, the polar opposite of a priest, but he presented himself as a holy man. She accepted that, and she moved him into the royal palace. <coughs> she moved him into the royal palace, and by 1914, when World War I broke out, he had an enormous amount of power, at least a lot of control over her. So... Uh, in 1914, when World War I broke out, though, Russia was considered to be a great power. In fact, Russia had a 15, and I think this is where we left off. Russia had a 15 million man army. Did we write that? The Russian steamroller, did we write yes. that down? The 15 million man army. Yes. <coughs> did we write that down? Yes. Okay. Well, some say yes and some say no. Anyway, 1914. Uh, Russia enters the war, and like I say, none of these nations should have gone to war. All of them are going to lose. <coughs> even the so-called winners, pardon me, even the so-called winners are going to lose. But Russia probably had the most to lose. Uh, but they did have a large army. There were 15 million men in their army, and it was called the Russian Steamroller. Okay, the Russian Steamroller. And here's how the Allies thought they would win the war. Uh, look at this map real quick. The French and the British thought, we'll tie up the Germans on the Western Front. We just won't let the Germans advance. We'll stop them here. And meanwhile, these 15 million Russians will come crashing in on the rear of Germany and crush them, and the war was, would be over. Russia was considered to be a very powerful country. I mean, if you're keeping up, keeping up with the news as of late, Vladimir Putin inv invaded the Ukraine. People thought Russia invading the Ukraine, the Ukraine doesn't have a chance. In fact, the Russian war planners said that they would take the capital of the Ukraine in three days, 72 hours, and we will uh, own you. They don't have it yet. In fact, they've been completely driven out of that region where Ukraine sits, back up into Belarus and Russia. Russia's losing that war. They looked good on paper, 
But when it came to fight, uh, you know, maybe the world is seeing that the Russian military is not as powerful as the world always assumed it would be. Well, the same thing is true with this Russian steamroller. Uh, here, these Russians were going into this the first modern war, and most of them didn't have helmets. Uh, they certainly didn't have gas masks. They don't have very many, many machine guns. They don't have any tanks. They have very little artillery. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, again, they're sending 15 million men into combat, and only four million of them had rifles. Uh, the, the Russian strategy was, it was to, when they went into battle, was to put all of the men who had rifles on the front row. If you were on the front row with a rifle and you turned around, there would be 15 guys behind you. And the whole unit would start forward, most of them unarmed, and the machine guns of the Germans would open up. And the plan was this. When the guy carrying the gun, the guy in front of you who actually has a gun, when he's killed, you pick up the gun and keep going. And when you're killed, the guy behind you will pick up the gun uh, and so on. But like I said, they didn't even have helmets. Uh, a lot of times the only uh, defense that these Russian soldiers had going into war, you know, they would be behind the hill here, about to go over the hill and attack the Germans, and they would stand them in ranks by the thousands, and they would put a Russian Orthodox priest in a cart with a vial of holy water, and, and the, they'd have a little donkey pulling the cart, and he would ride in the ranks, and he would sprinkle them with holy water, and then they would just sit over the hill, completely unarmed. And they were told, if you find a rifle, you find a dead German out there, and his rifle's beside him, pick it up and use it. Well, get this down. Under those circumstances, it shouldn't surprise anybody that uh, when, the German, when the Russians attacked the Germans, the Germans wiped them out. In fact, we've talked about the Western Front. Now I'm talking about the Eastern Front. Look at this map over here, the front between Germany and Austria and Russia. And the Russians are going to meet disaster there. In fact, right up here, okay, right there, about right there, a battle was fought. It's to get this down. It's the only, I'll ask you this on the uh, quiz tomorrow. And some of you will put the Battle of the Marne or Argonne Forest or the Somme or something like that. All those battles are fought on the Western Front. The only one battle I'm going to talk about on the Eastern Front, and it's right, right up here. Uh, and it was the Battle of Tannenberg. Write that down. The Battle of Tannenberg. And at the bottom, this is just an example of what went on on the Eastern Front. At the Battle of Tannenberg, in a day, a million Russians were killed and wounded. 260,000 were killed, 800,000 were wounded in a day. In fact, the German machine gunners killed so many Russians that the bodies piled up in front of the machine guns. They couldn't get a clear line of fire. And in the middle of the battle, they had to send troops out to kick down the dead piles of Russian soldiers so they would have a clear line of fire to kill more Russian soldiers. So the war, get this down, quickly turns into a disaster. The war quickly turns into a disaster for the uh, Russians, okay? There's Tannenberg right there. Uh, the war quickly turns into a disaster. At this point, get all this down. At this point, you know, the capital of Russia is right there. Uh, it's St. Petersburg in World War I. Today, Moscow is the capital. But anyway, St. Petersburg. And uh, the Tsar, of course, when the war starts, and this is a big mistake that he makes. It may have cost him his life. The Tsar leaves St. Petersburg. Once the war starts, he leaves St. Petersburg, and he goes down to the front lines to command the army. He takes personal command of the army. You know, up until this point, the peasants of Russia, the common ordinary people of Russia, supported the czar. They believed that God had sent him. And the attitude was, if you attack the czar, you're literally attacking God. So most of the people of Russia supported the czar. But uh, at this point, there he is. There's his train. He's just arrived on the Eastern Front. There is General saluting. There he is. There's the little czar bitch. He's in his uniform. He's in his uniform. But when the czar went down to the front, this is a crucial, crucial mistake. When the czar, you know, he should have stayed in St. Petersburg and run the war from the palace up there, the royal palace. But he goes down to St. Petersburg, and then things like, excuse me, he goes down to the eastern front, and then things like Tannenberg happen, uh, the slaughter at Tannenberg. And because he was there in person, the Russian people are going to blame him. If he had been back in St. Petersburg, he could have blamed these guys, okay? The, the, the blame would have fallen on them. But since he's there 
personally in command of the uh, Russian army. The blame fell on him. And when these disasters, get this down, when these disasters start happening on the Eastern Front, that is when the Russian people, the Russian people for the very first time, start to fall away and, and, and not support the czar anymore. Uh, that that's when when he begins to lose the support he begins to lose the support of the uh, of the people so this is a disaster and by the way get this down the uh war world war one caused the russian people to finally rise up and overthrow the czar because with the war going badly now listen to what i'm going to say to you and get these groups down when the war with the war going very badly for russia there were several groups in Russia, there were several groups in Russia who for years, get this down, who for years had been trying to overthrow the Tsar. For years they had been trying to get rid of him. Uh, but the Tsar had a strong uh, secret police, and the secret police would hunt these people down. They would torture them. They would throw them in prison. They would shoot them on the spot. Uh, and these groups had not yet been successful. But when World War I happens and Russia starts losing World War I, this opens up a gigantic opportunity for these groups who had long wanted to get rid of the Tsar. People like, get all these down, people like the Socialists, the Communists, and you can put a big star by the Communists because they're the ones who are going to overthrow the Tsar, the Communists, and write this group down, the Bolsheviks. And just uh, there, there is a difference at first between the Bolsheviks and the communists, but they, um, they uh, unite uh, and they eventually overthrow the Tsar. If I say to you, if I say to you, it's like me saying to you Marxism, that's just another way of saying communism. If I say to you Bolshevik or anyone else says to you Bolshevik, that's just another way of saying communist. So those groups were inside, listen, when the war started, those groups were inside of Russia. They were working to overthrow the Tsar, and the war presents them with a great opportunity because when Russia starts to lose uh, the war, the people start to turn on the Tsar. And when the people start to turn on the Tsar, these people have an opportunity to overthrow him, and they're going to take that opportunity, and they're going, they're going to overthrow the Tsar. So that takes us, get this down, to the winter of 1916-1917. Okay, because the Russian Revolution is going to happen in the winter of 1916-1917. And in 1916, here's the war going badly. The war started in 1914. Millions of Russians are dead and wounded by 1916. Uh, and the night, winter of 1916-1917 was one of the worst winters in Russian history. And when I talk about a bad Russian winter, we had a little snowstorm a couple of weeks ago and it shut down the state for about a week. You were out of school. But when I say a Russian winter, I'll just put it to you this way. 25 years later, after the events that I'm describing to you happened, 25 years later, Hitler will invade uh, Russia in World War II. It's the worst mistake it's the worst mistake that Hitler made. In fact, Hitler lost World War II in Russia. You know, we like to think, well, we've defeated Hitler, and we played a role in that. But the biggest mistake that Hitler made, the thing that destroyed him, was his invasion of Russia. And in that winter of 1941-42, the temperature dropped to 70 degrees below zero. It got so cold that that oil froze in tanks. Hitler's Hitler's blitzkrieg, his war machine, his lightning war had overrun all of Europe. And then they get to Russia and they have that winter and they stop. If the oil in your car freezes, you can't start it. And if you're driving a tank, it's the same, it's the same thing. So uh, when I talk about a severe Russian winter, I'm not talking about it was below freezing. It was 28 degrees. Now let's call school off. I'm talking about a winter in which it's 40 degrees or 50 degrees below zero. Now, I would get some of this down if I were you. Anyway, 40 or 50 degrees, you can do your other things, adjust your wardrobe later. But anyway, um, uh, in this horrible winter, get this down, you know, the war's going bad. If it's not bad enough. In this horrible winter, communications broke down, communications broke down, transportation broke down. You know, the, 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 the food coming in from the countryside, which there often was not enough of that, but what food there was, 
didn't make it to the cities. And that's something else I want you to write down. The Russian Revolution, it doesn't begin out on the farms. The Russian Revolution will begin in the cities. In fact, specifically, it began in the streets of St. Petersburg. People were starving. Get this down, hunger. People were starving. Hunger is a vital component in why this revolution that destroyed the Tsar and Russia uh, happened. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but hunger is the catalyst. Write that word down. Catalyst, that means the cause, the leading cause. Hunger is, has been the catalyst of most revolutions. I just told you the Russian revolution. What's the catalyst? It's hunger. People are starving to death. Until they, until they were starving, they pretty much supported the Tsar. The French had a revolution about 100 years before the Russian Revolution. Well, 120 years, 125 years before the Russian Revolution. You know, the French had been ruled by a, a, a dynasty of kings called the Bourbons, all those Louis you've probably heard about. And when did the French people finally rise up and take fat Louis and chop his head off and then chop off the head of his beautiful Austrian wife? What caused them to finally do that? Hung, when they got hungry. The French people bore a lot for 500 years. But when they started to starve to death, that's when they rose up and they got rid of the king. Hunger has been the catalyst for most revolutions. Can you name me a revolution in which hunger was not the catalyst? Yes, go ahead. The, US Revolution. the American Revolution. The American Revolution. If there was ever, just think about this. If there was ever a revolution thought by well-fed fat people, fat and happy, that's what our forefathers were, fat and fairly happy. <clears throat> they were full. It was a revolution. That's, that's unique. That's a revolution fought on full stomach. So why did they fight it? They weren't hungry. So why did they, why, what, what, what was the cause of this revolution? In 1775. Taxes? Huh? Taxes? Taxes? Oh, you know, that's, that's what they make you memorize all those taxes in middle school. You think about that for a minute. I'm going to go pay my taxes today. If I seem that I'm not my normally cheerful self that you see every day, fifth hour, that's why I'm going to go give a bunch of money to the U.S. government. I'm not happy about that, but I'll tell you what. It's the rent I pay. People are always grabbing about taxes. I've got my check. I don't write checks anymore. I've got my check here to write out to the IRS, the eternal, <laughs> eternal, the internal revenue. So I'm not happy about that. I'd like to take that two or $3,000 and I don't know, I'll take you all the lunch somewhere. <clears throat> but I've got to pay it to the government. <clears throat> but this, it's the rent you pay for living in this great republic, okay? It's it's the rent you pay. I have no doubt if I lived in China, my taxes would be much, much, much cheaper. I don't even pay any. But I don't want to live in China. I want to live here. <clears throat> but anyhow, I've lost my train of thought, so you get me to, oh, but taxes, yeah, do you think they were all sitting around the tavern in 1775 and somebody came riding up, burst in the door and said, they've just raised the tax on tea. And they jumped up and grabbed that, that's it, damn it. I'm going to, you know, raise my taxes, I'm going to start shooting somebody. You think that's why they did that? No, no, there was a deeper reason. You know, people have to have a deep reason to put their life on the line usually to die. <clears throat> So what was the cause of our revolution? What was it fought over? It was fought over an idea. Ideas are powerful things. I've told you that all year. At one time, communism was just an idea bouncing around in Karl Marx's head. At one time, Christianity was just an idea bouncing around in, I think it was St. Paul, St. Paul's head. At one time, the idea of a republic was just something bouncing around in some old ancient Roman's head, but ideas are powerful things. They shape the world. So what was the idea behind the American Revolution? I've tried to teach you that since August. <clears throat> I'm amazed that you don't know that. What? Well, they were fighting for liberty. I'm glad you said that because most people say what? Freedom! No, liberty. And it's an enormously different thing, freedom and liberty. So they were fighting for that. But let me just say in what word, you're not wrong, but in what words did they put that? All men. All men remember that? Do you remember that? All men, That's the idea that founded this country. At one time, that was just bouncing around in some people's heads. And that's what gave you this country, this republic that you, that you live in. You understand that most revolutions are fought you know, the French fought a revolution. They said, we're going to get rid of that tyrannical king, Louis. He's taken away all of our rights. 
And who did they get at the end of the revolution? They got a bigger dictator. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, who ran the country to rack and ruin. ruin. <clears throat> who who, um, who uh, restricted their liberty. The French people think about that. At the end of their revolution, they find, found out that they had, after all that trouble, fighting and dying, they had less freedom, liberty, than they had when the revolution began. I'm about to tell you about the Russian revolution. We gotta get rid of that czar. He restricts our rights. He's taking away our, and they got rid of the czar, and at the end of it, who did they get? They got a guy named Lenin, and when he died, they got a guy named Stalin. And you know what Lenin and Stalin did? Between them, they killed almost 100 million Russians. <coughs> and for the next 75 years, liberty didn't exist. That's what they got out of their revolution. Look at the difference in your revolution. You know, I ask students all the time, do you live in, a, is this an exceptional country? Nah, America's not an exceptional country. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. Is there more liberty in this country today than when this was written? Huh? Is there? Yes or no? I mean, it's, huh? Yeah, how many slaves you talked to lately? None in your life. None of you vote, but how many times have you gone, you know, if, uh, this were not, if you go to vote, ladies, we just put a, another woman. You understand now? There are four women on the Supreme Court. Katanji Jackson is the new justice on the court. Just approved. There are four women on the United States Supreme Court. That's approaching a majority. They get one more woman, and women will have a... <laughs> When the Constitution, when this was written, women couldn't vote. Nobody could have, they established a Supreme Court and they just said, well, it'll always be men, of course. I mean, nobody even thought about it. They didn't give it a thought. This document right here has expanded liberty. Americans have a lot more liberty today than they had in 1789. And we're getting more every day. And that's the way the founders intended it. Our, our, our revolution was radically different our revolution was radically different than any revolution in history. You live in an exceptional country. I'm not saying that as an American, which I'm proud to be. I'm not saying that as a patriot. I'm proud to be. But you live in an exceptional country, and I just proved that to you. Exceptionalism means that, you you know, when people say, well, an exceptional athlete, that's somebody. Well, I would say, I don't keep up with pro law, but I would say Tom Brady is an exceptional athlete. Would you say that? Do you believe it? Why? Why would you say that? Why would you say that? I'm looking back to the athletic corner back there. Why would you all say that? I, I will bow to your expertise in this. What? Well, there are a lot of people that are good quarterbacks. Why is he exceptional? Well, yes, maybe. But what else about him that makes him exceptional? He's 150 years old and he's still playing. Isn't that true? I don't watch pro ball, so I have to rely on your expertise. I don't know. What is he? Is he 40? How much? When did most of them quit? 30? And he still, did, what, didn't he Didn't he almost retire this year? Now he's coming back? Who's he going to play for now? The Buccaneers? Okay. Show you how ignorant I am about professional football. Where are the Buccaneers? Tampa Bay? I'll well, say I'm not as dumb as I thought. Anyway. I would say he's exceptional. You live in exception because he's done something that nobody else maybe has ever done. That's what makes you exceptional. You're not just good. You do something that no one else has ever done. This is the first country in history. And by the way, it is your country and you're a citizen of it. This is, this is the first country in history founded on the idea that all men are created equal. And you know what? When that those words were written, all Americans weren't equal. But you know what those words have enacted? It's an idea. You know what those words have enabled us to do? To have more and more and more and more and more and more freedom. That makes us an exceptional country. Most revolutions end in a failure. Most revolutions end with people having less freedom or less liberty than they did before. This one certainly did. So anyway, hunger was a major, major cause of this. Well, get this down. There was a food shortage. People were starving, and so they started gathering in the streets, protesting in St. Petersburg in that bitterly, bitterly cold winter. And of course, 
the Tsarina looked out the palace window, saw those mobs of people. And she thought, you know, the Tsar is off on the front. She thought, you know, this could turn into a revolution, and it could. And by the way, they had warehouses full of food that they could have opened. I guess those warehouses, I don't know this for sure, but I guess those warehouses was food for the army, or what, but they could have opened it. Who did she go to? So she didn't know what to do. Do I open, you know, here's this mob demanding food. Do I give them food or, you know, do I send out the army? So who did she go to for advice? Rasputin. Rasputin. Write that down. She goes to Rasputin. Should I give them the food? And Rasputin said, send out the army and shoot them down. He said, look, your majesty, if you give in to these people, tomorrow there will be an even bigger mob. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. He told her this. He said, the Russian people love the feel of the whip. Send out the cavalry and whip them. And they had a special cavalry called the Cossacks. Have you heard of the Cossacks? They wore the fur hats. And they sat up on their horses in these big fur coats. And across their saddle or around their saddle horns, they had a knotted rope about all that long. Uh, and ingrained in that knotted rope, they had pieces of jagged metal and glass. And when the Tsar would send them out to break up a mob of pe peasants or brothers, they would ride among them and whip them, you know, just literally lacerate them with that. So they sent out the Cossacks and they sent out the army. Um, and uh, of course, the mobs continued to grow. Well, at this point, get this down. At this point, a group of Russian nobles, get this down. At this point, a group of Russian nobles, nobility, the upper class, by the way, the upper class knew that if there was a revolution, who was going to be the first people whose heads were on the chopping block? The upper class. The upper class, yeah. So, this man, and you don't have to write him down. You don't have to write these people down, but this is a perfect example. This guy right here, his name was Felix Yusopov. He married the Tsar's niece. That was the Tsar's niece, and her, was, her name was, or her title was, she was Princess Arena, and she was considered to be the most beautiful, beautiful woman in all of Russia, Princess Arena. She's the, the Tsar's niece, and so he marries her. Now, he was uh, homosexual. He had several male lovers. I don't know if she minded that or not, but they were married. Uh, and he married her for one reason, to get, in the in, get into the royal court, and he got into the royal court. So he goes to the Tsarina, and he says to her, we've got to feed these mobs of people. If we don't do it, there's going to be a revolution and they will kill us all. And the Tsarina told him, no, I'm, you know, I'm conferred with Rasputin, and he's told me not to do it. Uh, and meanwhile, the mobs grew, and the mobs grew, and it looked more and more like a revolution would break out any day. So get this down. He comes to the conclusion, the Tsarina will never listen to us unless we do what? Who's between them and the Tsarina? Rasputin. So what did he decide? What do we have to do? We got to kill Rasputin. Get this down. So he came up with a murder plot. Very quickly here. I'm out of time today. He came up with a murder plot. He said, I'm going to kill Rasputin. Okay. There's, there's Yusopov's house. It has uh, uh, 11 or 1200 rooms in it. Okay. When you go through that door, it's still there. I mean, I've never been there, but when you go through that door there, <clears throat> there's the front hallway. That's the entrance way. You've got your phones. You can take them out and take a picture of that and go and tell your parents you want your bedroom remodel like that by next Thursday. But anyway, that's just the main entrance there. So what Yusopov did is, I got this down, he, you know, he decides to kill Rasputin. So he invited Rasputin to a party, a big party at his house. A big imperial ball. You know, there are going to be hundreds of people there, he said. And we would like for you to come. Well, of course, Rasputin, as powerful as he was, he didn't like parties. He didn't like, oh, he liked people. I don't think people liked him. He didn't like to go out and socialize. And so he said, no, I'm not going to come to that. And um, Yusopov told him this, look, I understand, you know, you're, you don't want to be around people, but, you know, here's the house going on. And he said, I've got a, a basement. You know, I guess today they, somebody said first hour, the, a man cave. I've got a man cave down there. And, you know, this wasn't a basement like you and I are used to where we go and hide when the tornado siren blows. It's got shelves and canned beans and 
spider webs and all that sort of thing. And, uh, this was a beautiful place. It had a great chandelier hanging in it. It had a white bearskin rug and a hand carved fireplace and overstuffed furniture. And so he said, you can just come come down here and just relax in this basement. And I'll, you know, we'll have the, the ball or the party upstairs. And Rasputin said, no, I don't want to come to that. I just don't want anything to do it. Sorry. And finally, um, finally, uh, Usopov said, well, you know, if you'll come, he said, we really want you to come to this. He said, if you'll come to this, he said, I will arrange for you to have some free time with my wife, Princess Irina. And of course, what did Rasputin say? Yeah. What time? And I'll be there. So he shows up. But anyway, uh, on the day of the party, get this down. Usopov, this is the murder of Rasputin. On the day of the party, Usopov, let me get Rasputin back up there, that rascal. Whoops, wrong way. On the day of the party, Usopov made sure that there was no one else in the house. He dismissed all the servants, said, go home. And that night when Rasputin arrived, came to the back entrance down to the uh, man cave. That night when Rasputin arrived, there were only three people there. There was Usopov, the doctor, and one of Usopov's friends. And in preparation for Rasputin, they had built a big fire in the fireplace. And uh, that doctor had uh, injected these little cakes with the cyanide uh, and uh, that he had gotten a wine decanter and uh, he had put some wine in it, but he had poured cyanide in that. Cyanide comes in liquid and gas form. If this was cyanide so strong, if this was cyanide and I just uncapped it and did that, it would probably kill all of us in this room. That's how strong it is. So uh, Rasputin arrives and you saw, you saw Bob greets him down here and you know, he sits down and Yusupov said, well, have some wine. My, my wife is up greeting the other guests. And just as soon as she's through, she'll come down here and spend some time with you. Um, so have some cakes. And so Rasputin took a bite of the cake and it should have just killed him. It would have killed an elephant. And he just sort uh, of gobbles down the cake. And, you know, uh, Yusupov's standing there and beads of perspiration breaking out. And he said, well, you know, have some wine. Well, you know, you drink some wine, and Usopov just can't figure it out. He just expected Rasputin to drop down dead. So he said, excuse me just a moment. And he goes back upstairs, and he grabs that doctor, and he says, I thought you said you put enough poison in those cakes and wine to kill a bull elephant. The guy's eating cakes and drinking wine, and nothing's happened. The doctor said, gee, I don't know. And so um, it's always good to have a plan B. So Usopov said, uh, you know, uh, plan B. So he goes down pulls the pistol out, and he goes back down, and when he gets down into the uh, basement this time, Rasputin is standing there in front of the fire and plays warming his hands, and, and Yusupov's coming down the stairway. And Yusupov comes down, and he says, Grigory Rasputin, say your prayers. And Rasputin kind of, huh? Bam! Bam! Shot him twice, and Rasputin just fell face first on the bearskin rug. Yusupov goes back upstairs. You know, this guy's 6'2", long and lanky cramped little stairway. He tells the other two, you've got to come down and help me get rid of the guy. Now remember, Rasputin's been poisoned with cyanide and shot twice. And so they go down and when they start to come down the stairs, they look and Rasputin was up on his all fours and he had his head down and he was just breathing like a wounded animal. Just, oh, oh, oh. And all of a sudden he snapped up his head and he let out this roar and he just goes scrambling toward him. Now remember, Rasputin's been shot twice and poisoned there's three, there's one of him and there's three of them and they've got a gun. They turn around and scream and run up the stairs and he's chasing them. And he goes staggering through the palace, you know, and uh, he starts out the front door of the palace and he just shouts back at them. He said, I will tell the Tsarina everything. And they thought at that point, we can't let this guy live. And so Rasputin staggering through the deep snow and they go out and follow him out of the yard and bam! Bam! Shooting two more times, drag him back in, yank down some curtains, lay him down, roll him up in the curtain, tie his hands, roll him up, and, and just for good measure, there was a heavy brass lamp there, and they bashed in the front of his skull, uh, and then they take him out to the Neva River, which flows through St. Petersburg. It's December, it's frozen solid, so they chopped a hole in the ice and slipped him in. And there's Rasputin. A couple of days later, some guys are ice fishing. And I don't know, what is it? Cart? Ah, it's Rasputin. So they pull him out, and uh, they're all sort of. I'm, I'm giving, listen, the version of this story I'm giving you is what 
Usopp of later wrote. And I'll just say this about it. And it's a lot of people have discredited it. I'll say this. Usopp was actually there. He was on the plot. But a lot of people have said, some people have said that when they did the autopsy, that he had water in his lungs. So, I mean, that after shot, being shot four times, poisoned, and having the skull bashed in, if he had water in his lungs, that meant when they stuck him in the Neva River, uh, he was still alive. He drowned. Okay. If that's true. If that, there's more controversy over this. There's people say, well, he just had a single gunshot to the back of the head. Could have happened. But his hands were untied. When they pulled him out, his hands were untied. And so that may be more evidence that when they stuck him in, he kind of struggled. You know, who knows? But anyway, Rasputin, Rasputin was dead. Okay, Rasputin was dead. He was gone. That's the Tsar, Tsarina's uh, chief, chief, advi chief advisor. Okay. And, you know, Rasputin, so he died. Uh, he had written the Tsarina a few weeks before this. He had written her a letter that said this. I don't think I'm going to live much longer. Well, here, let me read it to you. It's just a short note. He said, I feel that I shall leave this life before January the 1st. He did. <clears throat> if I am killed by common assassin, in other words, if ordinary people kill me, you have nothing to fear. But if your relatives kill me, then no one in your family will remain alive for more than two years. They will all be killed by the Russian people. End quote. Within two years, the czar and his entire family, they were all dead. So what does that tell you? Ooh. What is it? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, no, he had power. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Lucky guess, okay? This guy's around for a long time. In the 1970s, which was the worst decade in human history, I lived through every rotten year of it. But just, you know, if you don't believe that, just go listen to some disco music. You don't have to listen to much of it. Just listen to it. But they actually wrote a disco song that people were dancing to in discos. This is how horrible that decade was. A few years ago, some former students of mine came back and said, oh, you know, over at OU, you know, we're having this thing now where everybody wants to dress up and reenact the, 70s, the 1970s. And I said, what for? But they actually had a disco song about Rasputin that people were dancing to. And it said this, and I quote, they put some poison in his wine. He drank it all and said, I feel just fine, end quote, a song about Rasputin. Well, anyway, after the death of Rasputin in St. Petersburg, the situation grows worse. Get this down. The situation grows worse. Now listen to me carefully, very quickly. Observing all of this that was going on in Russia, there's a revolution building. Russia's losing the war. It was Germany. Get this down. Germany. Ger Germany's watching that. Very quickly here. Germany's watching this. And the Germans, real quick, the Germans said, the Germans believed, if we can start a revolution in Russia, get this down, if we can start a revolution in Russia, that will take Russia out of the war, okay? If we can start a revolution that will cause Russia to drop out. Look, these two million, and remember, this is in 1917. The U.S. has declared war. The U.S., they hope, is on the way. But the Germans are trying to figure out a way to win the war before the Americans can arrive. And they said, look, if we can knock Russia out. If we can cause a revolution there that will take Russia out of the war, then we can take the two million soldiers that we've had here on the Eastern Front. We can take the two million, two million German soldiers that we've had here on the Eastern Front, rush them to the Western Front, and defeat the British, defeat the British and the French before the Americans ever arrived. But we've got to start that revolution in Russia. And get this down. They were looking for someone to do that, and they found him here in Switzerland. Get this down. They found him here in Switzerland. And when we come back tomorrow, we'll talk about that person after your quiz. And we'll finish the revolution and go on.
say that. He's fed up every time he got Yeah, get off me. Yeah, put some back on my name. Um, so we can be kept man up above that test for in his face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most nice TikTok ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I really don't want to do that. See, that's why I like my general studies degree. You know, I'm gonna work some math for you. Well, Avery, you have to wait for everybody to finish them. Oh, like, you have to finish them. Oh, 
It's, it's not fun. Yeah, it's I don't know. Where's the thought? It's, 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 it's not. It's not. How many questions? I'm gonna say all this. That that wasn't the case last year. That was elementary, though. Yeah, welcome yeah. to the. You can sleep. You can daydream. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Are they pretty Are they pretty good? 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 No, no, not at all. But I'm going to flex on history. I'm going to flex on the history. Is it U.S. history or Oklahoma history? What do you think, Andy? <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I think it's, 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 it's Oklahoma history. It was U.S. history, right? The best bullshit. Uh, 1907. Yeah, like that's that's, it. that's all I know. It's when we became a state. It's when Oklahoma history started. I could have told you that. It was Mason Lewis. You know Mason Lewis? I think they did a problem with the history of the Great War. Yeah. Who did China? It'll be over China. Who did China? I think the war was great. It's like some Mongols. No, no, no. No, no. Yeah, no, and the most yeah, went around. Yeah, they, they just went around. Because they were not. Both of you are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what's that like? Why, why is my name? <laughs> what is it like? What is it like? Never mind. It probably doing what means wrong. Hey, Andy, you're, you're like friends with Zelensky, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, cool. my, that's, my, that's my man. That's, 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 that's his dad. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he used to have a nice mother. He's 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 a nice mother. Okay. Uh, so we talked about the USS Yep. Yeah. 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 And all of those, you know, Airedales, those air would stand up there. And of course, we were rain slickers because that was the wake of that stinking thing was washing back. And we were as close as we were to that wall back there. And the wake of that water washing over. So they thought that was really funny, you know, watching all of us. Go. So, there's, the, there's the real USS Miller right there. That's my ship. No longer there, but there it is. Uh, see a history question. Come on. Yeah, yeah, one ship was what, the what best. Old is wise and interesting. Yeah, what was the greatest ship in the U.S. Navy? According to your the greatest ship. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be the USS Maddox, though. In my opinion, the, 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 your ship was that the, the greatest ship, ship or the dumbest yeah. ship in the Navy? <laughs> Start a war. A we might have. Oh, we might have just been shooting at flying fish. We don't know. Let's have a war. Yeah. Let's not I think the greatest ship is Boat One Hundred Nine. Heroes were born that day. I wasn't born in '65. Yeah, you were. Okay. It was '66. It was. It was. We've had several times. Well, I get them. I get them right on the test board. I don't know what you get. Did we talk to you? I haven't. I mean, grades don't matter. It don't matter. We're talking about hundreds. Do you have one? Um. Well. Uh, Reagan built up the military, and I think it was $34 million an hour they spent, or 37 I said in my notes in there, that they spent an hour for eight years. And uh, he pushed the Soviets over the edge. You know, the Soviets had a big question to answer. You know, we talk, I've told, I told you Reagan <laughs> ran up the first trillion-dollar deficit, and people were stunned. I don't know what those people would think. Some of us are still alive, but I wonder what, what a lot of them would think with a $30 trillion deficit today. But, uh, you know, his critics will say of Reagan, well, he, 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 you know, he made deficit spending acceptable. And that's all we've done since Reagan is spend money we didn't have. And Reagan made that acceptable. It's the first trillion dollar debt. His defenders would say, yeah, but what did he spend that money on? And, and the bulk of that money, they would say, went to 
building up our national defense, and that broke the Soviets. The Soviets had a big question to answer. Could they provide both guns and butter? Meaning this, could they have a first-class military that could take on the United States and at the same time, uh, at the same time uh, provide a high standard of living for their people? Uh, I want to tell you, you know, in the 70s, you didn't want to, I mean, if you were on tour, you didn't want to get a blood transfusion in Russia. You just didn't want to. It was really dangerous. Uh, on a blood transfusion, something that had been perfected here for many, 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 and, and the rest of the world for many years. Uh, they were that far behind. Again, you know, I, I don't believe the so Russia has, to, uh, this is just my opinion, but I don't believe they have, I guess I need to start this. God almighty. This just... Uh, 